Amen. Bonjour. Good morning. Queer Mora. I think I've covered all of us. Amen. Welcome to the house of the Lord. I pray this morning is going to be a huge blessing to you. And um, I'm going to, just after we pray, take one or two minutes just to recap on what we established last week. And then we're going to go into the, into the Word of God. Amen. We're thankful this morning that the Springboks beat the Welsh yesterday. Amen. It was only grace because clearly their backline had no plan. So we're thankful. Amen. Let's just pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you're a good father. We thank you, Lord, that we can always come to you with expectation, no, expectation knowing that your, your heart and your will is to give to us, to love us, to just love on us, Father. We thank you that your word brings life and it brings health. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would open the hearts of your people and that you would speak through your word to your people and that you would bless your people this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you are for us and not against us. I thank you that your plans for us are plans of goodness, plans of grace, plans of mercy, of a good future, Lord. We honor you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm just going to move this down a bit. feel like my voice carries a bit. Genesis 1.29, we established last week that says, God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, seed which is on the face of, the, uh, of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. And then we also looked at Genesis 8.28, 8.22, where God says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, Winter and summer, day and night, shall not cease. So we established that, uh, we saw that God established a way that He works, that His kingdom works. If you look at the parable of the sower, it actually says this is how the kingdom of God works, by sowing and reaping. Sowing is the word of God, and He sows, the ground where He sows in is in our hearts. So when we receive the word of God, we receive it in our hearts, and we're going to get into that this morning a little bit. And we see that it's not only a natural law, that it doesn't just work like that for farmers, but it's actually sustained by a spiritual law that God established. We, only, we also looked at the fact that seed will always carry the nature or the source of the seed. A, a Granny Smith apple, seed will bring forth a Granny Smith apple. Amen. Three. So we, we also saw that seeds multiply. It's never a one-on-one -on -one with God. If I sow something, God will always multiply it. If I sow um, good works, God will multiply good works. If I sow money, God will multiply money. Because of the source, that the nature of that seed, that remains the same. Amen? And if you plant a seed, we looked at it, we said that seed will bring forth a tree. That will bring forth many fruit with many seeds. Those seeds will bring forth many more trees with many fruit, with etc., etc. So the, the, the law of sowing and reaping goes hand in hand with the fact that multiplication takes, takes, takes uh, effect on, on those seeds. We also say that the seed is very much the vision of the sower. It's in the vision of the sower. And I gave you the example that when I was a small kid, I would use watermelon seeds and I would spit it at my brother. So my vision for the seeds would be, I want to spit my brother. When I grew up a bit and I was at school, we, we took uh, seeds and we planted it. And we looked at if it's planted in a little ground or more ground, which one grows quicker, which one lasts. And now that I'm older, I look at seeds and I think, but if I take all these seeds and I buy a piece of land, and I start planting them, I can actually grow lots of watermelons and start selling and actually begin an industry. Amen. So how I work or use those seeds is really dependent on my vision, on what I feel I can get out of the seed or the seed can bring to me. Amen. So every seed, um, and it's important this morning to understand it, carries the nature 
And I've mentioned it before. Carries the nature of that seed, where it comes from. And then I said to you last week that the Word of God, let's just do that one side. The Word of God really is a bag of seeds. This is our seed. We saw it in the parable of the sower. He says that he sows the word of God and the ground is our hearts. So we accept the word of God in our hearts. Thank you, John. If you go to John 12, 23 and 24, I want to look at three different parts of sowing this morning. Because if we have something like sowing, if you have a principle in, in, or a law, you need to understand how it works or how it runs or threads throughout the whole word. And even from a redemption point of view, we see that it works with sowing and reaping. John 12, 20, 23 and 24 says, But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Jesus was talking about himself. That's why he says to them, the hour has come that I must be glorified. And then he goes into this and he says, if a grain of wheat falls into the ground... It dies, but then it brings forth much fruit, much grain. Romans 8.29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Today, if we, if we are born again, our confession, we believe unto righteousness that Jesus died, that he rose up again. So our belief is unto righteousness. Our confession is unto salvation. And we confess that this is what Jesus did. Amen. So the fact that Jesus died. Today there was one Christ. Today there are many Christians. We are from that. We, we are part of what, what happened on the cross. If you work through Galatians and you work through Ephesians, you, say, you see we are part of, the, part of that death and resurrection if we believe in that. Amen. And then when, when, we, when we get born again, um, our, whole sp our whole spirit gets renewed. Amen. But we're born again from incorruptible seed. Thanks, John. 1 Peter 1.23 says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. When you place this word of God in your heart, in your life, when you speak it over your situations, it will never not bring forth fruit. It's not corruptible. It can't be like I plant tomatoes or the watermelons and some of them grow and some of them don't because they get rotten or they've got too much water. This seed can never be corrupted. Amen. It, it lasts forever. John 3, 6 says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. When we are born again, we are born again in our spirit. Now, this is very important to understand. I remember when I got born again, man, that first two, three weeks, everything was greener. I was more peaceful on the road, which in itself is like a miracle. <laughs> and everything was wonderful. I thought everything was changed. I was just, I was, I was such a blessing. Amen. Then I started to realize, but I'm still bad at math. Like, I'm still bad on the road. I still fall into to various temptations and things. I still get angry. I still had to pray, Lord, this guy in front of me, just give me grace, not power. Because if you give me power, I'm going to drown him. <laughs> Amen. Then I realized, but wait a minute. It doesn't make sense that if the Bible says I've become a new creature, that I still have these old habits. Then I started realizing things like this, that it's my spirit man that's born again. I'm a spirit, a soul, and a body. I mean, very, very key to understand. And my spirit man is born again. And when I sow anything, 
If I sow to the flesh, it's out of the flesh that I will reap. My harvest will be a fleshly harvest. But if I take this word and I spend time in it and I meditate on it and I read through it and I, and I, and I really just make it part of my daily life, then I'm sowing to the spirit. I'm sowing incorruptible seed into my spirit to bring forth what the spirit of God has already laid in me out. Amen. Romans 8 says, 8 verse 9 says, But you are not flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. When we are born again, the Spirit of God comes and lives in us. Amen. So if your question, maybe this morning you have a question, because I've had this question asked me or spoken to me about it a few times in the last few weeks, is if I don't speak in tongues, does it mean I don't have the Holy Spirit? No, when we are born again, we have the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is something different. But when I'm born again, the Spirit of Christ lives in me. My spirit is renewed. I have some, God comes and he deposits everything that he wants for me already in me. Can I quickly kill one religious cow? Jesus doesn't walk around today. The Holy Spirit doesn't float around today to see who he can bless, who he can, um, who he can heal, who he can, it doesn't, uh, guys, we are his hands and feet. We are his voice. We walk around today listening to him who we must bless. Amen. 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 It's not a, this is not a mystical kind of, it's pretty simple actually. Jesus comes and he lives in us and he, and he makes us new. Uh, uh, Galatians 6, 8 says, for he, so, for he who sows to the flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit uh, uh, reap everlasting life. That everlasting life in Zoe is uh, it's called Zoe in Greek. It's the Zoe life. It's a God kind of life. The kind of life that God planned for you. Amen. If I look at the church today, we very, very much look like the world, unfortunately. We've got the same... I, I'm subscribe to a number of church leadership things, uh, uh, newsletters and websites. And I can tell you some of the news that I sometimes get on there is shocking. We go through the same kind of depressions. We go through the same kind of divorces. We go through, and you might say to me, Rian, yeah, but it's life and we're all just human. But really, one third of us is Holy Spirit. It should not be the same. We should not be the same. We should not talk the same. We should not look the same. We should not live the same. It should not be the same. Amen. Amen. The world doesn't have one third Holy Spirit. We do. Amen. We do. We live from a different place. We don't live by our feelings. We live by faith. We live by the Spirit. You know, God is challenging me these last few weeks to become more spiritual. And if I say more spiritual, I'm not talking about praying more or walking around more mystically or airy-fairy. I'm talking about being conscious of the Holy Spirit in my life. Being conscious of what God wants to do. What God wants to say to me. What God wants to say through me. It's just that, that consciousness. Thanks, John. Philippians 4 verse 8, I'll, read, I'll quickly read that from my Bible. Sorry, I'm, I'm reading out of the Amplified, so it might sound a bit different to, to your Bible. But it says, For the rest, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of reverence, and is honorable and seemly, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and lovable, whatever is kind and winsome and gracious, if there is any virtue and excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think and weigh and take account of these things. Fix your minds on them. The second thing I want to talk to you this morning is thoughts, our thought life, how we think. Because how we think will affect what we do, what we say, how we act. It literally affects every part of your life. And every one of us, whether we like to know it, and maybe if you're a philosopher, you'll 
come and help me uh, afterwards. But I believe any, anyone and everyone has a philosophy. Because what a philosophy is, is just a way of thinking. It's a place from where we think from. Amen. Every human being is God. That's why Jesus, uh, Paul says to us, he says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he's saying, you've got to make sure that you renew your thinker. Amen. Amen. That you, you're not one of those Christians that now I'm born again, I'm going to heaven, so I'm, I'm fine, I don't need to really... You know, I'm covered. It doesn't work like that. Amen. We're supposed to have an impact. We're supposed to be witnesses. We're supposed to be different. Amen. So he's saying, and this is important, my spirit, I'm jumping the gun a little bit. Anyway, my spirit is born again. My mind needs to come in line with what happened in my spirit. Amen. I believe and this is some Rihanna uh, uh, theology. I absolutely believe that everything I need has been deposited in me already. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross 2,000 years for my salvation, for my healing, for providing for me, and He's given it to me, and I have to work it out. Paul says, work out your salvation. And we do it by renewing our minds. And we renew our minds not just to our own types of thinking. We renew it to this, to the Word of God. We renew it by planting in us the incorruptible Word of God. Amen. You know, we have all of these um, motivational speakers. And I mean, I've listened to them. I've read some of their books and we have these guys that make videos and they, and they bring all these things that you've got to, um, as it says in Proverbs 23, for as a man sings in his heart, so easy. And they built multi-million dollar industries around these things that if you think right and you believe right, if you confess right, you'll, and they think it's theirs, but actually what they do is they steal from the word of God and they make it something that's theirs, which it's not. And we as a church sit and we go and we actually buy these books. Me, I did it as well. And all the time it's actually in here. And God is saying, you're wasting money, buddy. I've said that. They didn't say that. I said, it's all in here. You know, they take things like imagination and they make it something to such a degree that we think, oh, you know, just. But imagination is from God. Having a vision is from God. Dreaming is from God. Looking at what God wants for you is from God. It's not, it's not their philosophies. It's not their teachings. It's all from God. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and he's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Thanks, John. I'm going to move here because I want to show you something. So for years when I, when I was brought up, I was brought up in church. My dad was a pastor and um, he became an evangelist when he was 17 years old. And he was an evangelist till he passed away last year, June. Um, so for 50 odd years, he's, he, was, he was an evangelist. And... You know, I grew up under a, a church denomination that was, your spirit is your heart. That was it. Um, and and they, they had some really straightforward teaching, and, and that was it. And I was always one of the most unpopular kids in the, in, because I asked questions. I want to know. Like if you say, John the Baptist ate locusts, I want to know. What do you mean by locusts? Like... Is God going to expect me to eat locusts? Well, I, I need to know this stuff because I don't eat locusts. I don't even eat fish. <laughs> Amen. So I've always been very inquisitive. And then when I started delving into this word of God, I started realizing, but wait a minute. Everything is in me. But now my question is, how do I get it out? Because if it's in there and I don't get it out, 
then it means nothing. Remember what I said last week, if I take a packet of seeds and I leave it on this, on a table or on the TV, like we sometimes do with our Bibles, if we just leave it, that packet of seeds, it remains dormant. It's just, it's just a seed. It's nothing. If you don't use the word, it's just that packet of seeds. It means nothing. But then I look at this scripture, and this scripture is, is fantastic. Uh, this is one of my favorite scriptures. It says, the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of and that's why I broke it up for you. Soul and spirit. And then it says joints and marrow. Thoughts and intents. Where do I have my thoughts? I have it in my soul. I have it in my mind. Your soul is your mind. and your. So my thoughts are here. Where do I have intents? We often say to people, I don't know. I just, I just know. I don't know how. I don't know. I just have a feeling. I just know inside, inside of me, my knower just knows. <laughs> Amen. I know that, I know that, I know I'm not wrong. I know God is in this. I know God told me this. It's in here. So he says, the soul, spirit. My thoughts are under my soul. My intents are under my spirit. It comes from inside of me. Your joints and your marrow, your marrow sits deep like your spirit. Your joints joins your muscle to your bones. To your, so what he's trying to show us here is that whatever's in my spirit, in the middle is my soul. My soul joins my spirit to my body. Whatever's laid up in the word of God, that God's deposited in my heart, in my heart, my spirit must take it through my soul. So I must meditate on these things. I must read these things. I must think on these things. I must make time for, for fellowship with God, for time in His Word, so that what's in the spirit can come through the joints into the body. Amen. We don't see the Word of God have an effect in our life because we don't go through this process of taking what's in the spirit to our outside world. So we just look normal. It's not supposed to be like that. Your heart is your soul, your spirit together where God speaks to you. Amen. Thanks, John. If we look at the... Um, as I said earlier, your thoughts, everything you think about... It, 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 it's so key. And it's not just, I'm not just talking about reading a scripture, and I am talking about that as well, but meditating on a scripture, taking um, this last few weeks, I've been meditating on 3 John verse 2, and I meditate on it not one day. I meditate on it. I spend time with it. I pray about it. I ask God. You know, I've read that scripture hundreds of times. For the first time the other day, I realized he said, you must pray for it. He said, brethren, pray that you may prosper. I pray that you may prosper and be in health. For the first time, in I don't know how long, God says to me, pray for it. But that's what happens when I start meditating. When I start thinking. Because now I'm starting to ask, but what is prayer? What do you want me to pray? When I pray for this prosperity, when I pray for this healing, what, what is it, Lord, that you want to show me through my prayer? And how must I pray? What is this prayer that I must pray for these things? Amen. So, but, but when I'm talking about thoughts, I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about your philosophy. How, what do you think about God? How do you approach God? How do you approach Jesus? Jesus went about doing good, healing all, bringing liberty and then his disciples say to him, show us the Father. And he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the personification of God, what God is. That's what he's saying. How do you see God? Because can I tell you something? If you see God as someone legalistic, and if you don't do this and this, then he's not going to do it, and he's not going to help. And gonna... Then how you approach God is very, very different to how someone that understands grace and understands the love of God approaches God. Amen. 
It's got to affect our philosophy. It's got to affect our, how you see the Holy Spirit. When I think of the Holy Spirit, I think of a helper. Amen. I think of somebody that's there. I think of the fact that Jesus said to his disciples, if I have to go away because it's better for you that the Holy Spirit comes. What a statement. These guys are walking with the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. And he says to them, it's better that I go because I will send you the Holy Spirit. How awesome is the Holy Spirit? Revealing Jesus to every one of us. Not needing to be one of the 12 or one of the 70 to have time with Jesus. Now through the Holy Spirit, we have, all can have time with Him. Amen. Amen. So it has to affect your philosophy, your thinking. You know, I'm so glad we had communion this morning because communion is one of my, my examples. But a lot of people will come to me and they say, yeah, they, they're a bit worried about communion. And it says that we have to confess every sin before we take communion. Otherwise, and I don't have the time this morning to break it open for you, but it's, it's not actually that simple. So Marlies and I have communion often, 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 at least at least once a week, if not more. Because communion to me is, when I have communion, I see Jesus coming to me and serving me, saying, this is my body. I've, my body was broken for you so that you can have healing. This is what I've done for you. You know, when he sat with his disciples, he took the bread and broke it. And I see that happening in my own life. And as I partake of it, I know I'm partaking of his body. And his body is not sick. So if I partake of it, then I can get healed. When I have the wine, I think of Jesus' blood that's given me a righteous foundation. A foundation that can now allow me to say, but I can pray for these things. And I can trust for these things. And I don't walk in condemnation. I walk in the freedom of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's what this word teaches me. So my thinking and my philosophy around it, uh, uh, communion is not to sit there and try and confess every sin so that I can... You can never be clean enough. You can never confess all your sins. That's why you need Jesus. Amen? So it's not about confessing every little thing and now I'm good enough and now, now I can partake. It doesn't work like that. You know, Jesus died for you to wash you of all your sins. To, to sit there and try and confess everything. It's like taking a shower before I go to bath. <laughs> it's like, why are you doing it? I don't want to bath dirty, so I'm going to take a shower, and then I'm going to get in the bath. No, people. I Man, if you do that, come see me afterwards. You... <laughs> okay, we show you, teach you. Amen. doesn't work like that. I come because I have a righteous foundation through His blood. When I have communion, all I think about is His love just covering me. Just Him coming and saying, I did this because I love you. I did this because you're precious in my sight. You're mine. I bought you with a price. Salvation is free, but it's not cheap. You were paid with a very expensive price. You were bought by the blood of Jesus. That's what communion is about. Amen. Philippians 4 verse 7 says, And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Now that you have that picture of the spirit and the soul and the thoughts and intents and joints and marrow and you see what the heart is, doesn't this scripture just come alive? Because now suddenly he's saying, guard your heart. I've got to guard my spirit. I've got to guard my thinking. I've got to guard my way of thinking. I've got to make sure that, you know, so when I preach things like this, my wife becomes a running commentary, people. Okay. We'll drive, and I'm bad on the road. I'm going to confess. I'm bad on the road. And then we'll drive, and I'll say something to someone, and she'll say, what seed have you just sown? And I'm like, Jesus, I'm leaving her at home when I preach. I'm not... <laughs> but doesn't it just now have an impact? Now you start seeing, but I've got to guard these things. When there's thoughts that come in, and we all have bad thoughts that come in, every one of us, 
But then to just take a minute and say, this is not of God. This is not going to glorify God. It's not going to bring peace in my life. It's not going to speak of what Jesus did for me. I'm letting it go. Amen. And that's something that we have to practice and practice. Because <laughs> if you think you're going to do it the first time, I've got news for you. Amen. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes a relationship with God. Luke 6.45 says, A good man, man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Thanks, John. I think it's important to mention here that when we look at seeds, we don't always just look at good seeds. Now, I focused the sermon last week and this morning on when we sow the word of God, when we sow good seeds. But you also understand that if you sow bad seeds, bad things are going to happen. If you've got a bad harvest, then you've got to change what you sow. Amen? It's that simple. It really is that simple. Start confessing what God confesses about you. Start seeing yourself how God sees you. Start looking at your life how God looks at it. Uh, another of my favorite scriptures, if you haven't realized, I've probably mentioned it in every sermon so far, is that God has good plans for you. Jeremiah says, the plans I have for you are plans of goodness and peace, an expected end. That's God's plan for you. Amen? Start confessing those things over your life. Start declaring those things. Start taking scriptures and start renewing your mind. And, and because you want good things to settle in your heart. So that out of your heart, your thoughts are changed. But also your mouth starts speaking. Because it's out of here that you speak. If you're stressed in your heart, that's what you'll talk about. You'll talk about how big your problem is, not how big your God is. Because it's from here. But if you're so filled with the word of God that nothing else that you can talk about is just either motivated by the word of God or scripture that comes up. Or, and it becomes to such a degree that sometimes I'll talk and I'll talk to Marlies and I'll tell her, you know, I'm not exactly sure where it is, but the Bible says this and this. Because that's what's in my heart. I don't know where that is when I'm in traffic, but the, most of it is in my heart. Amen. But what the heart is full of, the mouth speaks. Amen. So Proverbs 15, 7 says, The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the fool does not do so. So the fact that he says the heart of the fool does not do so tells me that the lips of the wise is obviously talking out of their heart. Because just after that, he says, the, the heart of the fool doesn't do that. Now I want to show you something great. Proverbs 4, 20 to 24 says, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. So in your mind, in your spirit, let it mull. Let it work. Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it spring the issues of life. Some, um, and that's not issues like you have issues kind of thing. That's issues like life comes forth. Springs of life. The King James, I think, says springs of life. Amen. So out of it comes the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Out of your heart. If you guard your heart, You'll speak life. You'll speak health. You'll speak in wisdom. Amen. You know that there's a scripture that says, a fool is known by the multitude of his words. I think it's in Ecclesiastes. A fool is known, Ecclesiastes 5, around there, by the multitude. Have you ever been around people that afterwards, the guy's spoken so much that you think to yourself, oh, It's exactly what the Bible is talking about. A fool is known by the multitude. Some guys, you just have to listen for a while, then you know where you're at. Amen. It's, it's true. A wise man thinks about what he says. A wise man 
thinks about what he's sowing. Because remember, this is important to guard your heart, to keep your mind, to stay focused on the word of God. Because every word is seed. And it will bring forth fruit. So if it's negativity that you speak, it's going to bring forth fruit. If it's godly and it's spiritual and it's life and it's provision and it's, uh, and it's healing, it'll bring forth the fruit. Luke 17, 6 says, So the Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, Be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. Now often... When, when I grew up, this is what I was taught. Even if you have small faith, you can do this. Like a mustard seed. Again, this is a bit of Rian theology, but I don't think that's what he's talking about at all. Because I can show you multiple scriptures, because this was my question. Lord, if I can have small faith, why, are you keep, why do you keep on telling you, and you are telling the disciples three or four times throughout the Gospels, oh ye of little faith. So if it's okay to have small faith, why are you giving them a hard time about having small faith? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. So my thinking tells me that he's not talking about having small faith here. He's not saying it's okay to have small faith. I think we all, not I think, the Bible tells us that we all get given a measure of faith. And we grow our faith by the word of God. So to have small faith is actually not okay. It's our responsibility to spend time in the seed, in the word, and grow our faith. Amen. I think what he's trying to tell us here is with faith, how you release that faith is you can say. If the faith and the word of God is in our hearts and the word of God is established in our hearts, we, the way we get it out is we speak it. When sickness attacks my body, I don't go and I don't wake up my lease and I say, oh, th this is wrong and that's wrong. I wake up my lease and we take communion and then I say and I pray that I will not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. I pray that your, your healing, Lord, will come speedily as your righteous, righteousness will be my glory. I pray scripture over myself. I pray scripture over the people. Amen. 